Hello, my name is Christina Davis. I'm the director of the program on US-Japan relations at Harvard University. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our Distinguished Visitors Symposium on Japanese economic statecraft in an era of US-China rivalry. This is part of a special series on Japanese economic statecraft co-sponsored by the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government, the Harvard University Asia Center, and the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. We are really fortunate that Zoom is allowing us to reach across five time zones, I gather, with uh, speakers from Tokyo to California to here in Cambridge. And we're really happy to have you joining us in the evening East Coast time in the morning Tuesday for Professor Shidaishi from Japan. This event is a very special one for our program because it is part of our Distinguished Visitor Program, which since 1987, the program has honored a leading individual whose research is of broad interest to those who work on Japan. So we have honored incredible people over time, including Sadako Ogata, the former UN High Commissioner of Refugees, Peter Kessenstein, Cornell political scientist of great renown, Yoichi Hunabashi, former editor-in-chief of Asahi Shimbun, and Professor Junko Kato of Tokyo University, and we are very happy that this year we are able to honor as our 2020 2021 distinguished visitor, Professor Takashi Chiraishi, who is currently the chancellor of the Prefectural University of Kumamoto. He has served as professor at Cornell University, National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. He's been the president of the Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. He's also been very active in public policy, serving in the cabinet office as the executive member for the Council for Science and Technology Policy. He's a well-renowned scholar who has written prize-winning books, including a wide range of work on Southeast Asia, his book, An Age in Motion, Popular Radicalism in Java, and he has also published on empires and many other topics across the study of geopolitics and Asian regionalism. We're very happy to have him here. And he is joined by an excellent panel to help guide us through this discussion about economic statecraft. We have Professor Saudi Katara, who is coming from California. Well, we wish she were coming, but she is zooming in as the Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Southern California. She has a new book out, Japan's New Regional Reality, Jail Economic Strategy in the Asia Pacific, which is extraordinary, I highly recommend it. And she's done a lot of broad research on international political economy, the Pacific Rim and Japanese foreign policy. And she also wrote a book on banking policy, which we were happy to hear a few years back in our program. Thank you for joining us again. We are also joined from just in town, Professor Daniel Dresner, Professor of International Politics at the Flesher School of Tufts University, who is one of the leading scholars of economic sanctions and statecraft, as well as writing broadly on US foreign policy. His book, The Sanctions Paragraph, is well known. And of course, he also has another persona in addition to being a scholar of great renown, is also having a Washington Post blog that is the best to read. And he has also written The Toddler in Chief, what Donald Trump teaches us about the modern presidency. We are very excited to have him talking about economic statecraft, which will also relate to his just published co-edited book, The Uses and Abuses of Weaponized Interdependence, which is right on our topic. Our fourth speaker, William Norris, was having a little technical difficulty. And so I am hopeful he's going to be able to join us, but he is in Texas and there may have been a power outage issue where, um, so I'll go ahead and introduce him in the hopes he can join us as our fourth speaker. Professor William Norris is Associate Professor at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. He is known for his extraordinary research on Chinese foreign and security policy, political economy, and East Asia security. His book, The Chinese Economic Statecraft, Commercial Actors, Grand Strategy, and State Control, is right on topic for helping us think about the difficulties that are faced in a region that faces rivalry and complex interdependence that leads to many opportunities and challenges for cooperation. 
We have an incredible panel of speakers here. And I also know we have a great set of individuals in our audience who will ask good questions to launch our discussion. So without taking any more time, I would like to open us up and each of our panelists is going to speak for 12 minutes and that will leave time for us to have some conversation afterwards. And I um, would like to turn over the panel now. Oh, I forgot. I have to announce our next event, um, Liberalization and Regulation in the Global Political Economy. This is going to feature our associates who spend a year as associates with the program on US-Japan relations. I welcome you to join next week as well. We'll be back at our normal noon time. Of course, tonight we are here in the evening on the East Coast to accommodate a wide span, including Professor Shidaishi in Japan. As normal, we would like you to keep your microphone muted while you are listening. And you can use the chat function to ask a question or a raise hand in the participant button. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, let me start uh, with what is happening now. The government under uh, Prime Minister Abe introduced some very important policy measures over the last, uh, I mean, final two years uh, in his administration. And the government under Prime Minister Suga is expected to do more on this front in the coming months. The government under Abe established a Council for Innovation study, study, uh, Strategy in 2011, uh, no, 18, the cabinet approved a set of policy measures uh, the council recommended in 2019 and decided to invest heavily in such emerging technology fields as AI, biotechnology, and quantum computing and sensing. The council also presented the government with another set of policy measures uh, in 2020, in which the concept of economic uh, security was for the first time deployed, I think, uh, in connection with Japan's science, technology, and innovation policy. In the meantime, a new economic policy group was established uh, in 2020 in the National Security Secretariat in the Prime Minister's office to coordinate the METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, MOFA, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, and Ministry of Defense uh, on economic security matters. The Foreign Exchange and Foreign Trade Act was also revised in the same year, 2020, to tighten control over foreign investment in companies with critical technology. The government also decided to shut out Huawei from building the fifth generation communication system in Japan. The government under Suga is expected to go in the same direction, but do more in the coming months. The Foreign Exchange and Foreign Trade Act will be revisited again. The government will also establish a new think tank for economic security and in the near future is likely to in introduce a security clearance system to vet researchers who are involved in sensitive and critical technology research and development and who are engaged in collaborative research with the United States and other strategic partners. It is not very hard to see what is driving Japan's economic security policy making in recent years. The United States started investing heavily in AI, quantum, and other emerging technologies in 2017. The United States also tightened security control over foreign investment in emerging technology areas in 2017-18, became more vigilant uh, about research collaboration with China put Huawei and other Chinese firms on the entity list and tightened uh, export control on these firms. I'm sure the government under Abe uh, was in good communication 
uh, with the White House under Mr. Trump. The NSS uh, National Security Secretary's chief was talking with his uh, American counterpart on a regular basis, even though it was only in 2019 that an economic policy group was established uh, informally in the NSS and METI started working on revising the Foreign Exchange and Foreign Trade Act. A second uh, slide, please. In this context, I would like to remind you that the guiding concept informing this policy process is economic security. Even though academics and policymakers talk about economic statecraft, the concept has no equivalent in Japanese. The concept of economic security is deployed instead. The concept of economic security is not a new one. What is new is that it is now deployed to identify a policy area that encompasses and links industry, science and technology and national security. Originally, the concept was used by Japanese officials and business people in the 1970s, mainly to refer to the ability to secure stable supplies of oil and other natural resources. Over the last few years, however, the concept has been expanded to refer to the protection and promotion of technology and industry for Japan's national security. In this sense, economic security is not exactly the same as economic statecraft because it is more narrowly defined. For example, ODA policy is not identified as part of economic security, even though international infrastructure development assistance has important implications for national security and economic security considerations have been crucial in Japan's decision to provide funding for some infrastructural projects, especially in Southeast Asia. Two questions then, what factors are driving this process and what are the long-term implications of this development? The third uh, slide, please. Let us look back at what the Japanese government has done uh, on the national security front over the last, say, 10 years. Prime Minister Abe returned to power in 2012 in a year, the government established the National Security Secretariat in the Prime Minister's office as a secretariat for the National Security Council. In the same year, a national security strategy was adopted. The strategy called for deepening and expanding the Japan-US alliance in such areas as missile defense, maritime security, space and cyber security, and disaster relief. The strategy also emphasized the importance of networking with partner states defined as states with uh, fit share with Japan, global norms and strategic interests. Geopolitically, this strategy is now framed in terms of Indo-Pacific. The national security strategy is due to be revised anytime soon. Uh, in light of the establishment of the economic policy group in the National Security Secretariat last year and the ruling LDP call for tightening security control over uh, technology and industry, the revised strategy is expected to place far more emphasis on economic security. As part of the national security strategy, the government in 2014 introduced a new policy for the transfer of defense equipment and technology in place of the previous de facto ban of arms exports. The new policy allows Japanese firms to export weapons and other defense equipment to states which are Japan's ally and partners. The Defense Equipment Agency established in 2015 
is responsible for defense equipment procurement and development. As part of its job, it now funds research in dual technology at state research institutions and universities, even though the funding is very small in scale. The policy for defense equipment transfer promises to be a very useful uh, policy tool, not only for maintaining Japan's defense security and um, defense industry, but also for security cooperation with other states, especially the United States and its allies, as well as ASEAN states and India. The final slide, please. The recent policy initiatives on technology, industry, national security front should be located in this longer context. I would say Japan's responses to China's increasing assertiveness and hegemonic ambitions are made easy by the increasingly tougher American policy toward China. Japan-China relations went from bad to worse under the Democratic Party of Japan-led government uh, from 2009 to 2012. And the government under Abe took time to put back Japan-China relationship on an even keel. U.S. rebalancing policy under the first term of Obama administration was definitely welcome, but unfortunately it lost, kind of lost momentum in the second Obama administration. When President Trump came to power, the regular channel between the prime minister's office and the White House was functioning well, even though uh, Mr. Trump's America First was worrisome um, and the American unilateral trade and technology offensive against China, such as banning semiconductor exports to Huawei, created problems for Japanese business. The importance of Japan-US alliance, alliance was never questioned. The change in US-China policy was welcome. American policy on the security, technology, and industry has made it easier for Japanese government agencies, private sectors, and universities and research institutions to reach a degree of consensus on economic security issues. It should be said as no surprise then that Japan's policy on security, technology, and industry has a major component of international cooperation, especially with the United States and its allies. The government decided to shut down Huawei from Japan's fifth generation communication system and to fund research and development in the sixth generation system in cooperation with the United States and some European countries. There are a few things the government need to work on in the near future. First, the government has to define what sensitive and critical technologies are, introduce a security clearance system, and hopefully to establish a new funding scheme for confidential research. Second, the government has to decide whether national security control over trade can only be done in accordance with international agreements such as Vassana arrangement as it is now, or whether the government can act independently according to its own national security interests, especially human rights, or and, uh, and doing something in between. This question is closely connected with trade. Japan's trade policy is now at a turning point. Over the last 20 years, it has been geared toward concluding FTAs and EPAs. And free trade has been equated with tariff reduction and dismantling non-tariff barriers. But studies show that FTAs and EPAs are now of marginal utility for Japan, meaning they no longer contribute much to Japan's economic growth. And Asia Pacific FTA, if concluded, will likely benefit China far more than Japan 
and the United States. Besides, we are negatively Im impacted by China's policy on state-owned corporations, forced technology transfer, and industrial subsidy. I think it is now time to start working on what I call WTO plus, which should address such questions as state corporations, industrial subsidy, technology transfer, and data circulation multilaterally on the basis of a coalition of the willing. And finally, the government has to revisit its ODA policy in light of economic security concerns. Economic security consideration was a factor in individual cases, but it is now time to make Japan's ODA policy more systematic in terms of economic policy. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating discussion of Japan's economic security, where it has been and the agenda ahead. Thank you so very much for your remarks. Now we will turn to Saudi Katara. Thank you. It's it's been uh, it's really a big honor to be here uh, speaking after uh, Shiranshi Sensei, who has been my hero for a long time, is really uh, such a treat for me. And you know, between uh, and then Dan and Will are I'm a big fan of their work. So this is really a, a, such a, a privilege and honor to be here. And I thank Christina and Shunji Shunji for inviting me. So what I would like to talk today in the next 15, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, is to talk about the geoeconomic strategy of Japan, uh, focusing on the quality infrastructure. Um, Christina kindly introduced my book <laughs> as she introduced me. This is a book that came out uh, last summer about Japan's uh, new geoeconomic strategy in the age of Pacific. Uh, this looks at the use of economic instruments to achieve the foreign policy goals, which is basically the economic statecraft. But you know, in this context, I would like to kind of put, put this in a context where there are a lot of, uh, there is a variety of economic statecraft out there. Uh, I think Shared Sensei was already talking about uh, kind of a defense, kind of economic security perspective, uh, uh, kind of aspect of uh, economic statecraft, while there are others in terms of more offensive or kind of influ kind of a way to gain more influence in the region is a kind of way of economic statecraft. And also the way that the uh, economic instrument is used could be kind of a carrot type of instrument where they provide something in order to gain more influence or leverage, or kind of a stick that Dan will talk about this, this economic sanction in terms of the penalty and the kind of pain that economic, uh, uh, economic statecraft could cause. Uh, here, I would like to talk uh, with the emphasis of rule and standard setting and institutional building as a way in which Japan in the last 10, 15 years really focused on its, uh, its economic, geoeconomic strategy, uh, especially within the region. And this was uh, made possible and it, was, it made Japan as a, as a pivotal state in the context of geoeconomic competition ongoing between uh, US and China. So here I would like to focus on the um, infrastructure investment uh, aspect of this. This was, uh, I looked at this infrastructure investment from kind of how Japan was in the past and how Japan has become. So this is from the kind of a buying power, the kind of a, a more mercantilist uh, entity that used Japan used to be in the 1980s to a standard setup. So Japan in the 1980s, Focused, focused on the bilateral relationship, foreign aid relationship with the, uh, with the recipient country where recipient government kind of supported by the Japanese industries would request foreign aid and Japan, Japan, Japanese government will give tied aid to these recipient countries where there's a you know, heavy emphasis in infrastructure building. And this was supported in a way to support Japanese construction industry. 
So there was a very, uh, this is a very deliberate approach on the part of Japan called Trinity approach where foreign aid, uh, Japanese investment as well as Japan's trade was packaged in one by creating uh, or producing, uh, engaging in infrastructure building. This will provide you know, more investment for private investment opportunities for factories and so on. And then that's you know, kind of an export, uh, also is the export as part of uh, what Japan can achieve through that. After 1980s, things change. Uh, you, OECD DAC, the rich uh, club, uh, rich club of the uh, club of the rich countries, have become quite, quite critical for that uh, for kind of achieve, uh, uh, that kind of approach, and there has been some pressure to anti aid, which is uh, in the Helsinki Accord in 1990s, and many other players have started to beat Japan on its own game in the 1990s, South Korea, and, and then China later on. Meanwhile, you know, some of the some of the practice that Japan implemented had created some backlash. Uh, this is the picture of Koto Panjang Dam in Indonesia, uh, where there has been a lawsuit uh, of kind of put forward against the Japanese government in terms of this uh, environmental or social in impact, obviously, which was uh, 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 dismissed. But anyway, so that's been the kind of history of Japan in the past. And this infrastructure investment as again in the 19, sorry, in the 2010, 2010s, after the global financial crisis, start to catch more attention uh, after about 20 years of kind of a lull that, that it went uh, under. Uh, partly because of the recovery from the global financial crisis really uh, made use of, uh, or could make use of the infrastructure investment, especially obviously led by China. And also uh, there has been uh, many of other, other discussions going on about infrastructure investment. This is not, this is uh, the data from the Asian Development Bank, which calculated that there is a $26 trillion of infrastructure invest need on, among the Asian economies from uh, 2016 to 2030. But it's not only the, the shortage or need of investment that is, the, that is at stake here. Obviously, infrastructure is about, about connectivity, and this really guides East Asia's connectivity overall. So investing in infrastructure in many ways is really crucial. And in some ways that connectivity is quite path dependent, that if certain railway is adopted by, from China, from Japan, it actually influences the next step of what kind of extension that will create and so on and so forth. At the same time, there is a discussion of quality of in infrastructure that how long it lasts, how much it costs, and, and so on and so forth, obviously including the social and environmental impact. And when it comes to investment itself, the bankability of these investments is questioned. Uh, it's not only that investment is good, but it has to be a viable and bankable investment, which can capitalize on some of the uh, private investment, hopefully for some of the countries. At the same time, kind of looking at the recipient side, obviously many of the newly democratic nations of uh, Southeast Asia are, are very willing to attract investment in order to kind of uh, uh, highlight the uh, achievement of the current leaders and stuff like that, which was uh, uh, definitely the case uh, in the recent past. And now in 2020-21, the COVID crisis actually put another spotlight on this infrastructure investment, not only kind of the sustainability of it, but also maybe these are the new growth, new or, or continued and maybe re strong, strengthened revive, uh, a growth, economic growth strategy that is really required after the COVID when it was you know, many of the emerging economies are hit uh, very severely by that. In this kind of context of infrastructure investment need, uh, the major player became China in the last eight years. I don't think I have to uh, describe what the Belt and Road Initiative is all about, but it was announced back in 2013 uh, as the President Xi Jinping came into power. And it kind of is to connect China with the road and with the sea to Europe and, and Middle East and Africa and so on. Uh, so this was a, a really a big, big initiative that's been pushed forward. Uh, the, again, that estimate of how much it's going to end up uh, investing in altogether is, you know, is debated, but from one trillion to two trillion, you know, so it's, it's a quite significant amount and many are 
get, uh, getting on the bandwagon. And obviously by uh, in, the in 2015, when uh, China introduced or introduced uh, AIIB, many countries got on, the, got on board, except for the United States and Japan, which was a kind of a shock to both the, the Japanese government, Japanese leadership and the US. Uh, so for China, it is you know, not, uh, and well, for China or those who look at China's uh, kind of uh, actions, they argue that it's not only to establish economic cloud or influence, or maybe even kind of going beyond, uh, kind of getting over the, uh, the kind of uh, excess supply within the country, but also this is a kind of a, a deliberate diplomacy statecraft on their part, uh, including some of the criticism of debt, debt trap diplomacy and then things like that. So in response, the Japanese government is partly uh, due to kind of uh, one of the way to kind of uh, regain its economic growth after the really devastating effect of the global financial crisis yeah, from 2009 around 2010, but uh, mostly in response to the China, China's uh, kind of uh, very forceful initiative, Japanese government and the Abe administration uh, proposed this partner for quality infrastructure. Announcement came right after the time that AIIB's uh, kind of final um, kind of closure of the founding members uh, took place uh, in 2015, but it was expanded, continued on, and uh, again promoted at the time of the G7 summit at Iseshima in 2016. Uh, many of the guidelines associated with the, this uh, PQI quality uh, partnership for quality infrastructure, including the accelerated approval procedure, expanded amount of, uh, uh, amount of pro uh, infrastructure investment, uh, up to $200 billion announced November of 2015, and uh, many ways to have uh, kind of guarantee, have ways to kind of make the investment easier. And, uh, and at the same time, most importantly, kind of a developing standard of these uh, quality infrastructure. Uh, Japanese government is very good at producing these uh, pretty elaborate uh, slides, uh, so I'm stealing one from them. It's a little dated because the amount provided says 11, uh, 110 billion instead of 200, but this is the kind of uh, vision that Japanese government has uh, in terms of who's collaborating and then so on and so forth. Now I point out here that you know, private funding is a very crucial part of what Japanese uh, government envisions in pushing this forward. Uh, but importantly, in the context of G20 in 2019, Japanese government, this was a coup that succeeded in having all the G20 members, including China, agree on this principle for quality infrastructure uh, investment. So this highlighted the uh, open and transparent procurement, social environmental sustainability, and looking at the life cycle cost so that it will not be like a, a cheap and, and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of easy to break down. And also highlighted the debt sustainability of the infrastructure. So altogether, in the context of this statecraft instrument, Japan has had some kind, you know, some level of advantage where Japan has been the kind of uh, uh, the one that uh, emphasizes the economic infrastructure or infrastructure investment in its uh, foreign policy, foreign, uh, foreign aid, foreign aid uh, profile. And uh, this is the, the amount is the, the right hand side, how much the billion, and then percentage is the, how much the percentage is within uh, once uh, the country's own uh, ODA profile. And Japan has been uh, capitalizing on that. And in some ways, the, uh, the uh, success of it is probably gauged by the fact that it's being followed by the United States, that, you know, so Japan did their own reform of JBIC, uh, Japan B uh, Bank of International Corporation to expand its uh, portfolio, kind of risk tolerance and, and uh, the ODA funded in the dollars through using the foreign exchange reserve and so on. But US basically followed the suit in 2018, 2019, they had the US Build Act to, uh, in, to uh, create a uh, create this institution called the US International Development uh, Finance Corporation, uh, kind of from the, the old OPIC uh, to the new one, expanded its uh, investment portfolio to uh, $60 billion, which is about double what they used to have. Also uh, recently, about a year and two months ago, uh, in November of 2019, uh, the 
the Indo-Pacific country of Japan, United States, and Australia, with the leadership, uh, this one was led by the United States, to uh, create this blue dot, blue dot network. Uh, this is, is basically called a Michelin guide, guide for the <laughs> infrastructure investment, where they actually certify the quality, the best practice and the quality of infrastructure so that other, uh, especially the private entity can, uh, can fund it. So this is a way to mobilize private capital and uh, really important for all the US, Japan and the uh, countries which are trying to kind of uh, have balance in the weight kind of put on in, in infrastructure investment in East Asia. So just to, to uh, wrap up, the way um, in which uh, Japan has uh, managed its own economic statecraft really came from its own kind of heritage where there has been a kind of complementary kind of uh, uh, at, uh, approach towards infrastructure investment between Japan and China. China has been the major aid recipient from Japan. And also it learned quite significantly of the way that Trinity approach is implemented in the context of the economic statecraft uh, you know, by Japan and then later on China. Secondly, uh, that you know, Japan has a significant knowledge and expertise in this field. And, and more recently, Japan has a major trust, significant high level of trust from Southeast Asia. And this has been a way for Japan to actually now, you know, for once, teach the United States how to do this and US is following suit. And, and thirdly, this is really important that standard setting is uh, one of the major instrument where Japan can apply to create an advantageous platform in this environment. And finally, which could be a, a challenge really is that you know, financing of this infrastructure for Japan or the United States for that matter is a challenge. It does not have the same facility of uh, mobilizing funds as China does. So in many ways, this quality is crucial in inviting, especially you know, kind of a, a investment from private sector to the bankable uh, infrastructure project. And nowadays with a significant amount of uh, inf institutional investors, no, not knowing where to put the money in, this might be a kind of a compatible place to, uh, to, to invest if the quality of that is secured by these certification. So I will stop here, thank you. Thank you for giving us a great sense of the theories of how Japan has come to the forefront in this area of infrastructure investment and incredibly rich presentation of the empirical patterns as well. It's wonderful. Now uh, we'll turn to Dan Dresner. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, let me get my presentation out. There we go. Okay. I'm um, assuming you're all seeing this. Christina, give me a thumbs up. Good. Okay. Uh, first of all, I very much want to uh, thank Christina for inviting me to be on this panel. I also want to uh, thank um, uh, Shirashi-san and Katara-san for their uh, presentations, particularly because mine is going to be somewhat different, but what they're talking about is just as much economic statecraft um, as what I'm talking about. Uh, and in some ways, I think this highlights the, the fact that, that economic statecraft as a concept should be thought of as relatively capacious in terms of what it can mean in terms of policy. But that said, there is no denying the fact that at least in terms of the United States, um, there has been a much greater emphasis on coercive economic statecraft uh, than there's been on uh, the use of economic statecraft as a form of, uh, or as, as an economic development strategy in any way. Um, so I'm going to focus primarily on uh, what we saw with the Trump administration, uh, mostly because we're only a month and a day into the Biden administration. Um, but it's worth pointing out that, that to the extent that Donald Trump had a coherent theory of, of statecraft, it really was rooted by and large in economic coercion, um, that he really believed when he was running for president in 2015 and 2016, that um, that one of the ways in which the United States could advance its economic interests, indeed advance its security interests, was through the use of a variety of tools um, of economic statecraft. That essentially, because everyone else was profiting off of the United States, the United States surely could use its coercive economic leverage to rewrite the rules of the game, as it were. Um, and while 
generally speaking, Donald Trump really was running against uh, what he would describe as the foreign policy establishment, and indeed took great delight in bashing the foreign policy establishment. Um, it should be noted to some extent that uh, this was a rare area where, in fact, there was some degree of bipartisan consensus um, even before Trump was elected, that during the Obama administration years, um, and even in the Bush administration before that, you saw a ratcheting upwards of the ability of the United States to use various tools of economic statecraft, most obviously in terms of financial statecraft, um, as a way of achieving certain foreign policy ends. Um, and so there were ways in which when Trump was elected, he inherited um, a set of machinery that was far more finely tuned, perhaps, than you would have seen back during the uh, days of the Cold War or during the decade of the 1990s. Um, the key points I want to make in terms of the, the, the sort of aspects of, of Trump's economic statecraft and where we're going to see going forward is that there is no denying that even prior to Trump, and, and Trump, is certainly, uh, Trump certainly accelerated this, you've seen a dramatic expansion in both the style of economic statecraft as well as the scope of economic statecraft. In terms of you've seen a much wider array of targets being threatened, and you've seen much uh, more variegated kinds of uses um, of economic instruments as a mean way of trying to obtain uh, political concessions. That said, despite the sort of greater ambition in terms of US economic statecraft, it would be safe to say that it is underperformed relative to expectations, that it has not yielded much in the way of actual tangible concessions. Um, what is disturbing, however, is that despite this relative failure, you can make the case that there has nonetheless been a significant ideological or ideational shift within the Washington policymaking community that is far more comfortable with coercive economic statecraft as a central pillar. Um, of US foreign policy going forward, in no small part because now this is seen as a necessary adjunct for US foreign economic policy. So as I said before, Trump really did inherit a, a very well-oiled machine um, when he was inaugurated. There had already been significant updating um, of export control laws as a way to sort of ward off uh, potentially uh, foreign direct investment by perceived hostile powers. Um, the previous before Trump had been inaugurated, Example of this came during the, the uh, frenzy involving sovereign wealth funds uh, about 10 uh, or 11 years ago. There was uh, definitely an evolution in terms of financial statecraft, uh, the degree to which the US had been able to use um, or essentially weaponize the dollar's role uh, in global capital markets had allowed it to um, impose much more targeted sanctions uh, on entities within states. Uh, as well as the leadership of those states. And indeed, in some instances, most obviously Iran, literally cut them out um, of the entire uh, uh, international financial system by denying them access to corresponding banking accounts uh, that would have held dollars. And furthermore, sanctions was a rare area where Congress, which has traditionally ceded a lot of foreign policy ground um, to the executive branch, sanctions were a rare area where Congress was in fact interested, uh, in no small part because sanctions are in some ways the perfect foreign policy tool for Congress. It is a way in which members of Congress can uh, support some sort of foreign policy gesture, but it is seen as a measure short of war and therefore presumably not so, you know, uh, bellicose or coercive that they would actually receive any kind of blame for actually imposing the sanctions in the first place. Furthermore, Trump had a theory of economic power that was relatively coherent. He believed that the liberal international order uh, had rigged the game against the United States. And so as a result, there were a whole variety of other countries that had essentially uh, profited much more from uh, the liberal international order. And therefore, uh, Trump legitimately believed that if he could threaten to disrupt that order, that if he could threaten to withdraw from trade agreements, that if he could threaten to withdraw from the WTO, that if he could impose tariffs, sanctions, and a whole array of other uh, you know, uh, economic instruments, that other countries would see the, the potential losses of that and presumably agree to whatever Trump wanted. Furthermore, uh, the Trump administration was much more uh, willing to engage in a variety of forms of tactical issue, issue linkage beyond just sort of simple tariffs um, or economic sanctions. Uh, indeed, you saw this in terms of law enforcement in which Trump sort of hinted at the idea that, that uh, a Huawei executive that was arrested uh, could essentially be traded back to China in return for certain other concessions. Um, and indeed, in some cases with Secretary of State Pompeo, the linking of Five Eyes, which is an intelligence um, uh, uh, cooperative between five separate countries, linking that to 
adherence or, or the denial of Huawei's, uh, uh, denying Huawei the ability to, to participate in 5G construction in those states. Um, he also took great delight in appointing people he thought were much more tough negotiators, namely John Bolton and Robert Lighthizer. Um, and he also implemented a wide variety of so-called maximum pressure campaigns, campaigns designed to not just impose traditional sanctions, but indeed go further than that and really find ways to cut uh, particular actors off as, as much as possible um, from the global economy. And this was articulated in doctrine in the form of the 2017 National Security Strategy. And to be fair, Trump had support on this, uh, not just from uh, Republicans, but Democrats. Indeed, at various times, Chuck Schumer, who is now the Senate Majority Leader, then was the Senate Minority Leader, would tweet in response to Trump's claims about, you know, trying to get tough on China, essentially to get tougher on China. Um, that there was therefore, you know, support uh, within the Democratic Party for this in some instances, and there was some academic support. This is essentially the key of uh, the core of Albert Hirschman's argument in terms of economic uh, coercion is the notion that the party that is made better off by whatever the status quo is, is presumably vulnerable to a cutoff of that kind of economic exchange. And indeed, even in my own work, um, I had previously argued that economic coercion should be somewhat more effective against allies than against adversaries. And in many ways, Trump's ire was directed far more um, at US allies than it was uh, at US adversaries. So there really was a, a, a widening of the targets that uh, the United States was considering in terms of imposing economic sanctions. Um, so there were a variety of actions, uh, which I don't want to, uh, that would that would take up all the rest of my time if I listed them all. Um, needless to say, it would, uh, the things that I would add is that um, Trump added, among other things, not just the idea of economic sanctions, but also the threat of withdrawal from a variety of international organizations. Um, as picky Yoon is the Universal Postal Union and as important as the uh, World Trade Organization. Um, he also, as I said, engaged in tactical issue linkage across a wide variety of areas, um, was willing to use unilateral action in the form of Section 232 tariffs, arguing that in instances of aluminum or steel, uh, economic imports represented an actual threat to national security, um, and also was willing to impose secondary sanctions, uh, particularly on the European Union with respect to Iran. And you saw a wider array of maximum pressure campaigns um, against many countries, most uh, obviously China. So how well did it all work? So there were a few successes, and it should be stressed like this. Um, one is uh, the notion that uh, Chorus was actually renegotiated, the US-Korea Free Trade Agreement, um, was renegotiated in relatively short order in the first four years of the Trump administration, although whether the United States actually got a concession from that is uh, another interpretation entirely. The set concessions were mostly symbolic. Um, on the Universal Postal Union, that actually is an area where the Trump administration did succeed. They actually were able to get the UPU to reallocate postal rates in a way that did not disadvantage uh, US uh, producers, particularly Amazon. Um, and when Trump did threaten to link tariffs to um, illegal migration from Mexico, I think it would be, and this is probably the most surprising success that, that Trump achieved, but he did actually get uh, the Mexican president to agree to the institution of a Mexican National Guard um, and to take a, uh, and, and impose much more severe restrictions in terms of the ability of Central American migrants to cross Mexican land and enter into the United States. Uh, that said, the failures were also significant um, in terms of tactical issue linkage. Although there has been now greater cooperation in terms of guarding against Huawei on 5G, uh, the Five Eyes issue really had very little to do with it. And indeed, you could argue that Secretary of State Pompeo's efforts to tie those two things together actually was counterproductive to what he wanted to accomplish. Um, in terms of using economic coercion for economic purposes, uh, whether you talk about the steel or aluminum tariffs or the attempt to renegotiate NAFTA into the uh, US-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement, um, the concessions either are non-existent or so minor that it can be uh, hardly called successes. And then finally on China, I, there is it would be extremely difficult to call uh, uh, the US effort to uh, change China uh, in terms of trade policies, a success in any way. There was a phase one trade deal that was signed, but that's noteworthy in two ways. First of all, China has not honored most of the commitments in the phase one trade deal, although to be fair, that is as much to do with the COVID-19 pandemic as, as perhaps what Chinese authorities want. But more importantly, when the Trump administration uh, first came in, they talked about completely revolutionizing and sort of 
forcing China to completely rework its economy um, in ways that would accord with uh, the rules of the liberal international order. And instead, basically what happened was that China simply agreed to buy more grain. Um, and so this really, in, in some ways, cannot be seen as a success in any way whatsoever. Um, the maximum pressure campaigns also uh, were a mixed bag at best. What they largely succeeded in doing was in raising uh, or imposing more punishing costs on the targets ranging from North Korea to Venezuela uh, to Iran in particular. Uh, the problem is, is that that then did not lead to any material concessions of any kind. Uh, Maduro is still in charge of Venezuela. Um, the Iranian regime is actually accelerating its program in terms of nuclear weapons. And it would be safe to say outside of a few photo opportunities, North Korea has been given no concessions whatsoever um, in response to the original set of sanctions. So what happened? Uh, why didn't it work terribly well? Um, it would be safe to say that the Trump administration uh, flunked a few sort of basic elements of economic statecraft. The first was, was that in many cases, the demands they were making on the target were so grandiose as to render them essentially unfeasible. This is particularly the case with Iran, in which uh, Secretary of State Pompeo's list of demands to that Iran had to meet in order to lift the sanctions were so unrealistic that they were not taken seriously as a, a bargaining position. Um, in multiple cases, the issue linkage that the Trump administration hoped to engage in was rejected um, in some ways out of almost on a normative basis by the, the targets. And this is particularly true of US allies. Um, and then finally, I think uh, Trump himself and some of his national security team took the rare success and assumed that that success would translate to other targets. So in particular, I think the Trump administration interpreted the success they had with Mexico to mean that a similar strategy uh, would work well with China, which was, of course, a really bad analogy because the US relationship with Mexico is fundamentally asymmetric one in which the US has significant advantages, whereas the US trading relationship with China is much more uh, symmetric and therefore unsurprised. And, and furthermore, the expectations of future conflict between the two states is much higher, which in both cases was a recipe for far fewer concessions. Obviously, the long term cost, and I don't want to belabor this, but sanctioning allies tends not to. Uh, uh, strengthen the alliance relationship all that much. And indeed, we've seen that to some extent, even in the month since Trump has left. Um, it was a successful way of strengthening the Sino-Russian Entente, which a lot of US policymakers believed was sort of a temporary alliance of convenience um, five years ago. And they're not saying the same thing about that now. Um, and over the long term, this potentially weakens structural pillars of US power. And here I'm primarily talking about the reliance on the dollar. The biggest success you can argue of the Trump administration's approach to economic statecraft is that the target they succeeded in persuading the most wasn't necessarily any other country, but rather the foreign policy community based in the United States. Uh, because what you have seen is a wholesale change of mind um, within, uh, inside the Beltway in terms of the approach to economic statecraft. There is an increased wariness of so-called weaponized interdependence, which is a concept that my colleagues, Henry Farrell and Abe Newman, uh, developed in a, in a wonderful article that I think came out in 2019 in international security, um, basically arguing that uh, countries that are at the center of key economic networks have enhanced uh, coercion opportunities. Now, for the longest time, the actor that has actually been able to take advantage of weaponized interdependence has been the United States. But it is beginning to dawn on US policymakers that there might be other networks out there, uh, things like social media apps like TikTok or uh, Huawei's role in 5G, in which the United States might be viewed as a target rather than a sender of this, and they are therefore extremely wary um, of uh, being manipulated by other countries, even though, by the way, there is no evidence that actual efforts at weaponized interdependence lead to a greater likelihood of success. And it should be noted that at least in the first month, even the Biden administration is at least making noises like they're not going to change anything in terms of what the Trump administration has done. One would hope that over the next few months slash year, uh, you will see a scaling back of, of tariffs, particularly toward allies. But I think uh, at least in the short term, they're not planning on necessarily changing the status quo. So the concluding irony uh, that I would say in terms of the differences in US economic statecraft is that there has been no significant increase in the success of US economic statecraft, despite more enhanced tools. There is nonetheless a significant increase in bipartisan consensus that there should be more coercive economic statecraft, um, which I, I you know, find somewhat amusing as a political scientist and somewhat saddening as an American.
Uh, and with that, uh, I will be happy to turn things back to you, Christine. Very interesting. You show there is still a need for more research on sanctions, when and how they work. And it's good. If there's a bipartisan consensus, we'll continue to have more sanctions to observe and evaluate following <laughs> your hypotheses. Thank you so much, Dan. It is um, with great regret that I say that Will Norris has not been able to join us. And so we are worried about how he is doing. Hopefully it is just a power outage in Texas and he otherwise will soon get power back and has heat. Um, but unfortunately he's unable to join us. I think the United States could use some infrastructure investment and <laughs> perhaps we can, turn some of the projects from East Asia to help out Texas. Um, but we do have an excellent group here for discussion and a big audience. I will take the prerogative of chair to ask a few questions. Now, this is such an interesting issue of thinking about how economic interests can tie to serve foreign policy. And Professor Shiraishi has told us about economic security in trying to make sure that economic needs are not vulnerable and the need for policies to protect like export control and other policies to make sure technology development does not make countries vulnerable to global supply chains or leaking of technology and sufficient development. So one side is economic security and at the same time, when countries receive the infrastructure investment that Professor Katata has told us, they do become vulnerable and dependent. And so I am curious, how does the concern of recipients lead to them shaping what types of projects they want and how they participate in their ability to continue to maintain these projects if they want a turnkey facility so they are not indebted for the continuous technology stream and flow from the donor, how is that shaping the way they perceive infrastructure investment? Is that a concern you hear as part of these projects? And along that line of thinking about these complex nuances, for Dan's study of sanctions and how do they work, if it's only one country sanctioning, you can cut off someone if they completely rely on your technology or a resource. And so that's where China having 90% plus of rare earth minerals or the United States having the core design technology of semiconductors gives them incredible leverage. But so much of economic interdependence is not that simple. And one country cutting off with economic coercion won't work unless others cooperate. And so the secondary sanctions where the US not only says we're cutting off, but we want others to cut off is what becomes a powerful lever of threat. So those are just three questions to start off a conversation thinking about how does vulnerability and interdependence go forward when countries are worried about um, economic security, receiving aid, and how can the US be coercive when we're only a small player in a global economy? Not small, but not the only player. We can start in reverse order, Dan. Okay. Christine, I want to be sure I understand your. So your question is, how can the U.S. continue to be coercive if you see, you know, in terms of there aren't many areas where the U.S. has this advantage like it does in semiconductors? Is that your question? Right. Okay. Um, I think the answer. I mean, one answer is is then again, this is the logic of sort of weaponized interdependence that Farrell and Newman have put forward, which is there are certain economic networks out there finance obviously being one where the dollar isn't necessarily going away anytime soon, where the, the implication of that is that it allows you to sanction a wider variety of actors without worries about blowback, um, at least in the short term. And that in part because these networks are incredibly difficult to adjust, 
um, over time that it basically gives the, the actor at the central node the capacity to engage in these sorts of behavior without much in the way of consequences, at least in the short term, which is why the US has been able to essentially engage in financial statecraft, not just during the Trump years, but really you could argue over the last two decades without that much of a diversification away from the dollar. Um, now your point is, well, the US is actually not that large of a trading state at this point, um, that there are other trading states out there and that surely you know, US market power doesn't count for that much. Um, and that's entirely fair. The other thing I would say is, is that really depending, and this is a, an open question of whether you will see this continue in successive US administrations. But one of the things the Trump administration clearly did was that they didn't see economic coercion as strictly a function of trade-based measures. They also saw it as a function of a variety of other measures, including, let's say, restrictions of foreign students studying in the United States, for example. Um, and that is also an area where you could argue, at least theoretically, the U.S. has a sort of position of dominance in terms of, of you know, research facilities in terms of higher education. Now, again, I want to stress that there's a short-term, long-term issue here, because in the short term, these structures are hard to change, and that does give the United States significant leverage. However, the more that it is, the U.S. is viewed as someone who will exploit these networks, unsurprisingly, you are going to start seeing an erosion of their ability to actually matter. And so that's my concern over the long term, I guess I would say. Okay, so thank you, Christina. Uh, and thank you for summarizing our discussion very nicely. And I, I guess I take the kind of middle question about the infrastructure, right? So, uh, you know, in, in that kind of vulnerability question as to how the recipient countries see, you know, governments see these in infrastructure investment, and I kind of have the kind of three things in general. So what well, one is in general that, you know, there is a, both kind of a timing consistency issue where, you know, you want the infrastructure, you don't really think about the result. And these are, you know, 40 year project, more or less things like that. And many of these you know, things like, you know, the kind of the, the ports in Sri Lanka and so on, uh, it was mismanagement, you know, well, you know, China might have some intention of providing carrot in, in order for them to have access to this and that, but the, the, the trap diplomacy itself, you know, usually are not intention, it kind of results uh, because of that. So, you know, many of these recipients engage in this thinking that they can manage without, you know, kind of getting into that trap. And, uh, you know, my research uh, with my colleagues, um, uh, uh, Jessica Liao on the high speed rail in, in you know, in, in Indonesia and Malaysia kind of show that democratic countries, the democratic leaders have a pressure to bring in these infrastructure investment so that, you know, kind of any good deals that they can get they would like to, and their you know, time perspective is next five years, not you know, 40. So that's, you know, that's one kind of a, a way in which we can explain why some of them, knowing that they could be vulnerable, would take on these things. But you know, having said that, you know, Japan is now capitalizing on that kind of worry that recipient countries have. So you know, the higher quality, maybe it's, you know, it's a bit, you know, well, quite a bit more expensive as you start, but the lifetime cost to be cheaper, you know, this and that, and standard, you know, standard of you know, kind of a finance and so on is much more transparent and things like that. That would reduce that kind of uh, uh, concerns and vulnerability. And as I said, you know, Japan is one of the most trusted country uh, by the ASEAN members, so that kind of also helped. Finally, you know, maybe this is a kind of kind of broader issue, which I don't really know that much about. But actually, my my uh, collaborator on another project that I'm working on, uh, Sarah Eaton, who actually got the uh, Alvi Prize uh, this uh, this year, uh, is looking at the standard setting competition that China is engaging in, kind of collaborate, you know, kind of engaging with the Germans, and then the, you know, kind of try to kind of engage in the standard setting uh, kind of. Uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, maneuvers of management. And then in many ways, you know, this might be a kind of a one area where it might be interesting to look into more as to how that standard setting kind of translate into either reduction or, or kind of maybe even increase of uh, such kind of vulnerability as infrastructure investment gets much more kind of a standardized or kind of rules gets uh, even you know, kind of a, you know, either a clearer or maybe you know, kind of swayed by China in some ways. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, um, let me respond to all of your questions, but briefly. Um, first of all, uh, the question of vulnerability. Um, generally speaking, borrowing money from many is better than borrowing from one. And that is probably what is happening now, uh, especially in Southeast Asia as well as South Asia. Certainly, Chinese are offering uh, many projects with their own fund, labor, technology, and so on. And selectively, Japanese government is offering. Uh, I mean, making their own, own, own they making the, their offers on those projects so that recipient countries can use Japan as a leverage to negotiate with the Chinese. So, I mean, if you look at all these uh, projects now in negotiation, there are quite a number of projects which I don't believe Japanese consortiums are not, in, uh, not really interested, but they provide offers anyway, because that will give leverage in negotiation with Chinese, right? That is actually, that aspect is quite often missed, but it is very important. Number two, if we look at the way in which Japan and ASEAN countries interact, there are, I think, two things which are very important to remember. One is infrastructure building has pretty different uh, significance for mainland Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia. In main, mainland Southeast Asia, infrastructure building is across boundaries. And they have, and in a sense, all the infrastructure, I mean, uh, high, uh, highways, uh, railways, uh, power grids, and so on, actually comes down from China to Southeast Asia, with Bangkok as a major hub. And what the Japanese government is doing in is building highways, uh, power grids, and so on, vertically from east and west. And therefore, while Chinese are building north to south. And therefore, at the end, the Chinese cannot create uh, what I call a hub and spoke system, but rather it will be open up internationally to the outside world. And, and that this is clearly informed by geopolitical calculation. And the other thing uh, is actually maritime uh, Southeast Asian states. For these states, the infrastructure building uh, across boundaries are not that important. They are more looking at, for example, ports strategically located or railway building in strategic and high densely populated areas. And if you look at, for example, border areas, uh, quite often Southeast Asian states are not giving their project, projects to Chinese consortium for obvious reasons. And as uh, Katada-san said, I mean, all the public opinion uh, research shows that Japan is probably one of the two most trusted states uh, by Southeast Asian countries. And therefore, they feel safe enough to accept Japanese offer to build, for example, ports in very sensitive, strategically located areas. So it's, I think that part needs to be kept in mind. And finally, about coercive, uh, I mean, sanctions and so on. I mean, from, I think, Japanese as well as European uh, American ally perspective, it is better if the American government wants to do economic sanctions, better do it multilaterally or collectively rather than unilaterally, because unilateral action quite often had adverse, adverse effect on Japan and European allies. And that in, in, in fact, and in the case of economic sanctions, they affect not government directly, but actually affect private sectors and undermine domestic support for the alliance as well as government in power.
And that is probably not American government who wants to achieve uh, in this kind of policy. Let us hope the United States government is listening. <laughs> hope so. We have uh, several questions in the chat. And I also invite people to raise their blue hand in the participants if they would like to speak directly. But I will start out by sharing some of the questions. I've received a private chat question from Richard Dyke that is similar to Bo Hao Wu's question. Both are interested in how Japan's involvement in free trade agreements has shaped the security and efficiency of global supply chains now that goods can be transported so low tariff, low cost within the region for ever deepening global supply chains. And what do you see the perception of this as reducing or increasing the competition between Japan and China? The question is directed to me or to, <laughs> could you tell us? Uh, who is supposed to answer? In the interest of time, I'll go, let's go ahead and have you briefly answer and Saudi, if you could have a brief statement. Well, I mean, actually, if you look at the tariff, I mean, uh, 80, more than 85% of Japanese trade, both exports, and uh, imports are now uh, tariff free. And therefore in that sense, the free trade agreements, I mean, uh, starting with uh, TPP, uh, Japan EU trade agreement, uh, FTAs with Australia, United States and United Kingdom and ASEAN all helped. Uh, and even though the, the American media tend to see RCEP, uh, regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, as China initiative. Uh, in fact, you know, Japanese also uh, welcomed uh, and signed uh, RCEP. And actually it is not only for Japan's benefit. And in fact, Japan is uh, benefiting more from than China from RCEP. Uh, but actually it is a way to maintain ASEAN centrality uh, because RCEP is uh, initiated by ASEAN. So in that sense, I mean, so far, uh, I would say that I don't have any problem with uh, FTAs and EPAs Japan has pursued over the last 20 years. But as I said, the benefit from coming this kind of F uh, EPAs and FTAs is declining and, uh, and now of marginal utility and therefore in view of the kind of, you know, I mean, uh, challenges we face uh, and WTO is not exactly uh, up to our expectation. Uh, maybe it is now time for uh, Japan, the United States and its allies to uh, start discussing a new trade regime on, on the basis of WTO. That is actually my take. Thank you. So, Thank so you. if I'm, if I may, may kind of, uh, uh, kind of come, chime in a little bit quickly. So two points. So one is that you no know, CPTPP, the Comprehensive Progressive, you know, uh, agreement of uh, TPP, uh, which concluded a few years ago, it has a lot of rules that is called platinum rules, which, you know, kind of prevents uh, these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, forced revealance of uh, uh, source code and stuff like that. So these are rule setting instruments, which are, which is quite important. And the fact that Chinese, uh, you know, Xi Jinping mentioned that China is interested in, you know, or, or what is it? positively, favorably consider <laughs> joining CPTPP is a kind of a great sign because I think this is really one of the ways in which uh, rules can permeate and then makes it easier uh, for many of these uh, kind of issues that you know, kind of the firms are having vis-a-vis -vis China. While, you know, in terms of the kind of effect of competition and so on, I think that's kind of more to do with the supply chain issues. And especially under the under COVID, there's a lot of concern about, you know, too much uh, supply chain kind of 
concentrated in China. So there is, it's not the free trade agreement, but there is a kind of a collaboration now that Japan is engaging with the India and Australia and, and kind of various countries about the Indo-Pacific context of supply chain resilience. And Japanese government is also trying to diversify or at least incentivize the firms to diversify supply chains. And that's that's ongoing in the context of especially the kind of uh, uh, the, you know, the COVID threat and you know, kind of a, a uncertainty that's out there. Um, again, that it's a re relatively new phenomena. So we haven't really seen the outcome of it. You know, obviously China will continue to be very important hub of production. So uh, you know, it might not change drastically, but there is an effort to avoid some of these kind of a risk of uh, concentration of the supply chains. Great. I want to bring in a question from one of our associates with the program on US-Japan relations. Natsuko Sakata has asked, what is the policy towards Japan's ODA policy in light of economic security? And in the context of thinking about Japanese ODA policy, should there be an enlargement of economic security so that Japan's ODA would be used to achieve those goals? Or is economic security um, generally seen as more restrictive and not something that would be applied in the ODA context? And Sakata-san, if you if I missed your question, you can ask yourself as well. <laughs> it's a very important and actually, how to say, tough question. Uh, currently, Japan's ODA policy is informed by the notion of human security. And this is a very encompassing, comprehensive notion. Uh, so in that sense, probably you can do whatever you want under this uh, notion. And uh, as far as I can see, ODA policy people, I mean, com com policy community people tend to sort of stick to this notion rather than to more narrowly defined economic security notion. And even though I am, I belong to this minority uh, camp, uh, probably it takes years to entirely revamp the ODA policy, but rather what is going to happen as usually happen here in Japan is a kind of, you know, I mean, shifting sort of compromise. I mean, and therefore there will be increasing more sort of economic security considerations in making individual uh, projects, but overall the policy notion, I mean, guiding policy notion will remain as human security. Thank you very much. What about the sustainability of China's debt trap diplomacy? So we are um, thinking about foreign aid as a benefit to the recipient and a potential tool of influence. And Charles Shiota in the chat question is concerned about the debt trap diplomacy and how many of these investments may actually come back to harm the Chinese banks who won't actually get repaid. So um, I wondered if any of you want to make a stab about the costs of poorly managed economic statecraft, which of course, it's not only a problem for China, I think Dan's presentation showed the problem for the United States that sometimes co economic coercion is not always good for the sender. I mean, actually, uh, this is really a question that actually you know, uh, occupies a lot of attention on my part or on many government officials part, I believe. Uh, and the most important fact is, uh, for example, all the, I mean, infrastructure funding from uh, Japan and other advanced economies are actually concessional loans, while Chinese state banks uh, provide commercial loans. And therefore, when uh, whatever country comes into a uh, really serious debt crisis, 
um, all the advanced economies can go to the Paris Club and work out uh, how to you know, deal with this crisis. But China is not part of uh, the Paris Club. And even if they agree with the kind of conditions under which all the other countries agree, I mean, quite often China's state owned uh, banks uh, are not part of this deal. And therefore, uh, compared with, say, 20 years ago, uh, when the East Asia crisis hit this region, I mean, now it's a lot more tricky to solve this kind of debt issue. And my sense is, in fact, we really need a new sort of multilateral or, uh, I mean, arrangement to deal with this kind of you know, debt crisis. I mean, be prepared. Uh, there will be mounting number of company, I mean, uh, uh, countries going into this kind of debt crisis in the coming years. Thank you. And I wondered, Dan, if you can talk about the costs of economic coercion for the sender. And I have a second question for you from uh, Shin Fujihira's directed asking about the possibility of the US Biden administration learning from Japan's experience in terms of a more business centered statecraft and whether there could be the possibility of shifting away from coercion and making statecraft a little more comprehensive. Dan, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll answer the second question first and then remind me of what the first question is, which shows how bad my short term memory is. Um, I am moderately optimistic that the Biden administration will scale back the degree of, of sort of coercive economic statecraft you've seen, particularly with respect um, to things like the Section 232. Uh, tariffs on, on U.S. allies, um, and to some extent, the secondary sanctions that have been imposed. Um, I am more skeptical of the, uh, of the idea that the United States will then pursue a more comprehensive form of economic statecraft, um, mostly because I'm not convinced that the politics of it would support large scale investments overseas, which is essentially what, um, you know, the, the Japanese version of this is. And, and to, oh God, I was on the tip of my tongue. What was the first, what was your first question? Oh, the cost of the sender, I remember. Um, in terms of the cost to the sender of economic statecraft, I think one of the dangers is, and one of the reasons you've seen the expansion of its use in the United States has been that the costs have actually gone down. Um, again, the, the issue here is that because in terms of financial statecraft, it's not like there's any other option necessarily um, in terms of uh, other than the U.S. dollar. It basically has allowed the U.S. to engage in these forms of economic statecraft without really disrupting much in the way of economic exchange and without necessarily disrupting too much faith in the dollar. Now, the, the question then becomes the extent to which the Trump administration in particular is looked at as an aberration or rather as an acceleration of an ongoing trend. The Obama administration was certainly willing to use these forms of financial statecraft as the Bush administration was before it, but it usually didn't do so unless there was buy-in from key allies. So if we think about the, the ways in which the United States got Iran uh, to sign the JCPOA, it imposed sanctions outside of the UN system, but it did so with the cooperation of the European Union and other key allies. Where the Trump administration you know, broke ranks was in being able and being willing to do this on a unilateral basis and basically forcing countries like Europe to go along with it. Um, the interesting question will be whether uh, you know, the Biden administration and the successive ones decide, oh, well, I guess we've learned we don't need to necessarily cajole allies. We can coerce them into co compliance. I suspect that it's not something the Biden administration is going to be keen on doing. Um, so hopefully the diplomatic costs of pursuing these kinds of strategies will be reduced just because you're not going to see them used as much as uh, deployed as frequently. And of course, we're seeing how difficult it is to manage economic statecraft to make sure it's done effectively. And, 
that there are different choices in how states do their aid policies. Some of the questions, especially from David Parker, ask us to think a little more about the process of how governments organize their decision-making for development assistance, economic policy. What is the interagency process? If you're talking about comprehensive policies that touch on security and economic interests. And I wonder if you could evaluate the US process, Dan, and then Saudi and Shiraishi Sensei, the Japanese process in terms of what could be done to improve the interagency coordination for effective economic statecraft. Um, okay, to be blunt, the interagency process during the Trump years was an unmitigated disaster. Um, it was essentially, uh, the, the, the interagency process was, did Trump tweet about something and then did the agencies reverse engineer whatever policy he wanted through that tweet? Um, so to the extent that there was an ordinary interagency process of what Christina, you or I are used to, we're used to in, in every prior administration really, you know, for decades is, is something else entirely. Um, I do think that under the Biden administration, you are going to see uh, a return to sort of a more traditional interagency process that presumably takes place under the auspices of the NSC. Um, one of the issues though, that, that is worth noting is that, and I think part of the reason that the US has also relied more on financial statecraft over the years, is that OFAC in particular, the US Office of Foreign Assets Control, is without peer in terms of being able to actually exercise these sanctions. And so they have more lift um, in terms of implementation um, than let's say USAID has with respect to foreign aid. Um, and so that might be one of the other issues, which is that when, it, when it, you talk about sanctions, the only implementing agency is basically OFAC. Um, whereas when you start talking about economic- Dan, can you spell out OFAC for oh, sorry. Uh, OFAC a broad is, audience? Yes, OFAC is short for the US Office of Foreign Assets Control. Um, it is a, a, it's an agency housed within the Treasury Department. Um, it, it handles all financial statecraft and all financial sanctions that are targeted. When you start talking about positive economic statecraft, then you are opening up to an alphabet soup of different agencies, whether it's the USAID, um, the Commerce Department, Millennium Challenge Corporation, OPIC, uh, or OP, uh, OPIC, the, uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And that you know requires a, a, a more complex tangle and genuinely requires a greater interagency process. If I can respond, and I would like to see, you know, hear what uh, Shirai Sensei is going to tell me from inside, right? So I've been looking at this uh, kind of policy decision process in Japanese government, and I see a kind of more streamlining of it in the last 10, 15, you know, maybe 10, 20 years, where it used to be so FTA, when they are you know, kind of making decisions on FTA, they have to have four ministries, the Minister of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, METI, well, METI, as well as Ministry of Agriculture to agree upon it. And it was very difficult to kind of make a bold move because obviously agriculture is an issue and then you know, other ministries have different kind of priorities. While, you know, especially as the administrative reform, as well as the kind of main uh, kind of much more active role of the Kante, the prime minister's office start to kick in, especially uh, you know, effectively done by the Abe administration during, you know, during the second round where you know, TPP was under the cabinet of you know, cabinet secretariat. The, the, you know, there was a task force you know, with all the bureaucrats, you know, the kind of very you know, criminal crop bureaucrat, but still uh, kind of main kind of a streamlined uh, line of command. And, and you know, in other ways, even in the foreign aid administration, it's been streamlined since the past. I mean, there has been you know, more like the kind of four ministry uh, kind of structure early on, but gradually it's been kind of more, more uh, streamlined. And I think that allowed Japan to be more effective in engaging in some of these economic statecraft because some of the policy uh, priorities can be reflected on the way that bureaucracy kind of, you know, kind of uh, respond to, uh, to, the, to these the demands or needs uh, based on their more streamlined structure. But I, you know, I would like to hear what uh, Shirai Sensei uh, has to say on that. Well, generally speaking, uh, Katata-san said is right. Um, 
2012, uh, no, 2013. I mean, uh, after Mr. Abe came to, I mean, one year after Mr. Abe came to power, the National Security Secretariat was established in the Prime Minister's office. And this really uh, made the policy making uh, process uh, centralized and also a lot easier to communicate with uh, the White House. So th this was a big actually uh, change. Uh, and uh, I also uh, mentioned uh, la I mean, last year, the economic policy group was established uh, in uh, the National Security Sec Secretariat. And that actually made economic, po uh, e economic security policy directly under the prime minister. And so I would say, depending on uh, who runs this secretariat uh, and the National Security Council, I mean, it can be run uh, very well or less than standard. I mean, Mr. Abe did pretty good job, but I'm not sure about the current prime minister. Um, and uh, the second point is uh, actually we don't have any group on ODA in the National Security Secretariat. That means uh, actually it is not directly under the direction of prime minister. Uh, instead, what I see, I may be wrong, but the impression I have is both the president of JICA uh, International Agency and, uh, and the head of uh, JBIC, the banking agency, these two chiefs are in regular communication with the prime minister and his assistants. And therefore, even though uh, uh, institutionally, it is not part of the economic security or larger international strategy part, I mean, uh, de facto individual cases are handled at the very top by these people. Uh, that's why I was saying that, you know, instead of just depending on individuals, we better institutionalize. That is my position. Great. Well, I think that some of the lessons from the conversation tonight would help for learning how to do statecraft better, but we'll have to continue studying in future occasions because we are at the end of our time. I would like to thank our panel very much for joining us tonight and giving excellent comments about different perspectives on this important question. I am extremely grateful to Professor Shiraishi to join us from Japan and serve as our distinguished visitor. Normally, this includes the honor of a keynote address at dinner at the faculty club with great food and toasts. I am sorry that we only have Zoom, but we are honored nonetheless to have learned from your uh, comments and observations. And it has been really wonderful to have Dan Dresner and Saudi Katara, your comments and presentations are excellent. Thank you so much to all of you for coming to join us. And I would like to thank the program of US-Japan relations staff, Shinju Fujihira, Amy Stockton, Emma Duncan, and Sophie Welsh for supporting the event and all of the organization. We're so sorry that Will Norris could not join us and that we didn't have the full set of the China perspective on statecraft, but Maybe we'll have a future opportunity and certainly we've all read his book and we'll continue to follow these conversations. So thank you very much. Um, and with this, I'll include, conclude our event. Thank you. Thank you.